Uh, good morning, everybody. Well, what an amazing start to the conference. Uh, uh, some totally inspirational um, speakers and a lot of wisdom. Um, so this panel is going to be looking at how you reached the disconnected youth, how you reached those young people who've become marginalized, who've opted out. Um, I'm the Chief Executive of the Royal Foundation of the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge and Prince Harry. So I'm based in London and I work with their Royal Highnesses and we're soon to be joined by Meghan Markle who will become a Royal Highness. Um, and um, we are the charity that puts into practice um, programs and initiatives in areas that their Royal Highnesses feel passionately about. And they are definitely not bystanders. They are very, very engaged in wanting to make a difference, um, particularly to disadvantaged young people. Um, we have a project uh, working on youth violence, and we also have a project where we try and train young people to become sports coaches, tapping into something that they feel passionate about. And these young people are not in education or employment when they start, but almost all of them go into employment or education after the year-long course. And we're currently researching into youth violence in London, which is a growing problem. And one thing that we're going to be discussing on the panel where you'll see that there are several common themes that no matter what the situation is, the draw, particularly for young men into violence is, is very, very powerful. Um, and we had, one of the things we do before we start is to try and get together the people we're trying to help to hear what, what it is that will make a difference to them. And we had a group of young people who'd been in gangs talking with Prince Harry in Kensington Palace. And one of them said something very powerful, which is, you can't follow the footsteps in the snow when there are no footsteps. And I think what everybody on this panel will probably say is, so often there are no footsteps. And we're going to start by hearing from each of them um, a story uh, about the people that they work with. Um, so we have uh, on the panel, just to quickly introduce them, uh, Omar, uh, who's a program manager with Mercy Corps in Jordan. Um, Essam at the end there, who also works with refugees, um, and he's a mental health director and co-founder of Humanity Crew. Um, Selena is working in Latin America with a lot of um, young people who are facing all sorts of issues and live in some of the most violent communities in the world. Um, uh, she works for Glasswing International. And uh, next to me here, Lashon is the National Coordinator of Community Action Teams for Opportunity Youth United. So I've asked them to each think of a story of a person because I think that brings to life how you can help uh, re-engage young people. But I'm going to start with LaShawn because he himself was a disaffected young person and there's nothing better than hearing from somebody who's been there, done that, and got the t-shirt, so to speak. And now he's helping lots of other young people make the most of their lives and their potential. So LaShawn, would you like to share your story? Absolutely. Um, I'll try my best to do this briefly. Um, so first off, I just want to start off by saying that I'm a product of a failed system. Um, and then I was blamed as the victim. And I say that because too often young people are labeled as disconnected um, or they dropped out and they're being blamed when really these systems have failed them and pushed them out. Um, and the reason why I say I got pushed out is because for two reasons. One, I got off to an early start. I went to a very good elementary school. They had a lot of resources. I was learning Mandarin in the first grade, and I felt really supported. Um, but then I transitioned into a Boston public school um, in middle school, and I could immediately tell the difference. Um, there were three kids sharing a book. We couldn't dare take it home, 50 kids in a class. Um, staff turnover was crazy. And then eventually a friend of mine got shot uh, and killed a block away from the school. So now we didn't feel safe. Um, and for all these reasons, again, I became apathetic. Um, I started to lose track. Um, and at a time when I needed support the most, they pushed me out. They kicked me out. They said, this is not working. I don't know what to tell you. Keep it moving. Now, as a young teen, that was a good deal for me. Word, I don't have to go to school no more. Now my mom can get off my back. Um, but left with nothing to do, I was left on the streets and, you know, 
I got into everything that I shouldn't have gotten into, right? Getting involved with the justice system, um, almost losing my life on sev several occasions. And then I think the, the, the cherry on top is when I attended the Brockton High graduation in 2008. I went to that graduation to support a friend. And at the time, I, like I said, I was worn down by this vicious cycle that I was into and knew I needed to change. And then I went to this graduation in 2008 to cheer my friend on, but then I realized that that was my graduation year. So here I was in the, in the stands at a graduation where I was supposed to be crossing the stage. And at that point, that's when I realized I need, I need a second chance. I need, I need to get back on track. I need something, but I didn't know where to go. Uh, but unfortunately for me, as a young person, especially a young person who has gotten involved with the, with the criminal justice system, your options are very limited, <laughs> right? So I was very desperate. I was applying for wherever I can go. No one would take me. But then I came across a program called Youth Build, um, and they embraced me with open arms. They showed me a lot of love. They showed me a lot of respect. Um, they saw potential in me that I didn't see myself, um, and because they um, supported me. I was able to go on and pursue higher education. Um, I just received my master's degree last year, um, you know, leading this national movement um, and trying to give back to the young people. Um, other young people are dis disconnected. There are 4.9 million in the U.S., 1.2 billion across the world. So um, how can I use my leverage, my platform, my experience to um, give hope to the billions of young people across the country who have been through the same situation that I've been through. Um, and I'll stop there. I think that's a wonderful story. And to go from a boy thrown out of school to a master's degree. Now to a very different world, the world of the refugee camps. Um, and that's where Omar and Essam work. So Omar, have you got a story of a young person that you'd like to share? I mean, you're, you're fighting with uh, a different kind of pull of violence and the violence that can lead into terrorism and membership of ISIS if you don't manage to get those people on another path. Thank you so much. Yes. Okay. So the story, the story I want to share with you, it's something that, that I, was, I was a part of and it, it happened with me, but I, I will talk about this affected youth, but from the refugee p parents' uh, point of view. So I want to talk about a woman who, uh, her name is Um Ali, which is a mother of, of Ali. And she, that woman, she works as a cleaner in our, in our centers in the refugee camp. Whenever I am sitting at my desk, the woman will pass by and just look at me and pray for me. And there's like three main prays that she always do. She always look at me and tell me, I hope, like Omar, I really wish God will give, will give you a good education and wisdom, and then she will leave. And I'll be like, that's nice of you, thank you. And then whenever she's passing by again, she will tell me, Omar, I really wish love that will give your parents a power to take care of you. And then when she's passing by again, she will pray again for me and tell me, I really wish God will surround you with people that, that you love and they love you. But once I was, and th that for me was normal, just like, like an old woman, just like praying for, for everyone. But once, one time I was sitting in my office crossing legs, and then she came and she sat down here, like she sat down beside me to take the, the garbage man. And I found that disrespected, so I told her, can you please stand up, because like I can't get it for you. And my, my legs was this, and then suddenly she hugged my leg and she started crying. Her, I, can, I can't imagine how her face, like it was, it was red and all shaking and she started crying. And then I just pulled her, like, pulled her up and we stand up and I was like, can, like, what's going on? Can you tell me? And she told me that I look like her son, Ali. And Ali, he is, he's still in Syria. And she started telling me about Ali, that Ali left to school when he was 12. And he was married when he was 15. And he has kids. And she was, she, when she was a mother, when she was in Syria, she was, like, she was not giving Ali positive parenting practices. And then after, after that, I, I, she told me that Ali now, he's in Syria. Like, after the crisis, he lost his wife. He lost his job, and 
his mother, Ali's mother and father came to Jordan, so he was lifted alone in Syria, and he was an easy target to be recruited by ISIS, by a terrorist group. And he was fighting, he was fighting with them. So literally it clicked to my mind that what, what Um Ali was praying for me is the things that she wished to see at her son. And she was telling, she was praying for my parents to be strong because she wanted to be strong, but she couldn't. She was praying for me to get education because she knew how much education affected Ali and made him an, an easy target. So after, after a week from that incident, I heard that Ali was killed in Syria. And then it was so hard for me to go to the camp because I, wa like, I was thinking that what's going to happen if I entered the center and Um Ali looked at me and started crying. I will be like, I don't know what's going to happen like with me. And then, but when I went to the camp, she looked at me and she came to me. She was like, Omar, I, like, I know that you heard about my son, but I want to be a facilitator teaching parents how to raise up their children. So that story for me, it, first of all, it's not just us we don't have to be a bystander as much as we have to encourage our beneficiaries not to be a bystander because they know what is needed for them. And, and, and also beside that, that story, that story af like affected me as a program manager to focus on education for youth, to focus on job opportunities for youth and also to focus, to focus on uh, developing a program for parenting uh, and, and a refugee setting. Because those are the, uh, the factors that can really affect a youth and make him more disaffected. An easy target to be recruited some, like, somewhere with a tourist group. Thank you. And that's a wonderful story and really reinforcing what Kofi Annan said earlier, which is the people themselves know what's needed. The people on the ground need, know, um, and it's about listening to them and using them. Um, Esam, I know you work um, particularly from the mental health perspective um, with refugees and children, supporting them. So perhaps you'd like to tell us your story. Hi, good evening. Um, I actually, we all of us living because of the stories. We are looking for a bitter story to tell our grandchildren, our friends, to tell the different story in Facebook. Um, and also the refugees is looking for bitter stories in their life. Um, the story that I want to share with you is the story because of the story, I am here and, uh, and established, um, I founded uh, the organization Humanity Crew. It's a story about a kid. His name is Omar. Um, this kid, can I have my slides? Um, this kid's an, an kid in 2015. He arrived in a crowded rubber boat, a refugee boat from um, Turkey to, um, to Greece. And when he went out from the boat and we assist him, I just saw his mother. She was very shaking and he was crying. And I asked from his mother, just give me the baby. Um, because I, I, I saw that this dyadic, they cannot handle the situation. And I just took the baby and me and the mother walking, walking from the beach uh, towards the beach. And he saw a helicopter just hovering above us. And, and Omar just said to me in Arabic, Ammu shuhada, uncle, what is this? Um, and it's, immediately I just told him, it's a helicopter. It's here to photograph you because you are a hero. You just crossed the sea. Just heroes can cross the sea. And I found myself making a dialogue with a four or five years old kid about um, about how to cross the sea and how, he, how strong he is. And then I told him, can you take me to your boat, please? Because I am afraid of boats. I am afraid of the sea. The sea, you know, just heroes can come close to sea. Can I see your boat? Can you take me there? And he just took me to the boat. And I saw that how his, his face starts to change from a frightened kid 
to a kid who starts smile to me and just you know looking all over and and try to find where he is and then he start when we were in the boat he start telling me yeah i sit here and i stop the wave with my hands and i and i uh, save everyone <laughs> and when we go up we continue the the sorry yeah we just continue the, um, the conversation, and then he start asking from the photographers, from the reporters there. He say, I'm the hero, take pictures, take pictures. <laughs> and it was lovely that all the reporters start taking pictures of him. And when we finish, and I pass his, uh, to his uh, parents, I told the parents, can you tell him this story every night? Tell him the story about the kid, the hero kid who crossed the sea. And it was the first kid, that, it was in the beginning, it, it, before Humanity Crew was established and founded. It's just when me and my wife, she's here, uh, went to volunteer in, in, in Lesbos. Then when we came back and founded Humanity Crew and we decided that what we would do is something just around mental health. Um, and I saw the picture and I saw the video of me and Omar then the idea came to my mind that the best thing is not to treat trauma, but to prevent it. And if we can change and reframe the traumatic experience of the kids and, and, and make it a story of, of being a hero, not a story of a traumatic experience, so it's better than to come three years or four years for a young man or a, a youth and try to change stuff there because the tree will be with uh, bad roots. But now if we work with the kids in this very early uh, stage of the trauma, um, we will have a better future for them, better integration. As Jane mentioned, I believe that ISIS and other terror, terror at, uh, groups do not recruit people, they fill gaps. And I think that mental health is the huge gap. And I think, and it's, I, I, I'm, I've, I know that I'm one of these people who is guilty. We as mental health professionals, psychiatrists, psychologists, we prefer to stay in our clinics. We like the position of Freud hiding the pipe and just sit there. We don't go to, to, um, to crisis zones like other doctors you see in them. I used to be a surgeon, maybe that's why I jumped there first. But uh, unfortunately, we are not there. The, the crisis zone is, is, is free from mental health professionals. And that's what we are trying to change in Humanity Crew, is to bring mental health to the forefront, because there is no, um, there is no first aid without the acknowledge that the soul is there. Because the damage to the soul is, is hardly visible, and it can be there for life. And we need to acknowledge this. Um, Omar pay in cash, I think, just immediately. <laughs> yeah, he did it. So that's why I love him. Um, and uh, this is my story. It's actually Omar's story. Um, but it has led to a wonderful initiative now, and you know, you helping to get these children to deal with their trauma and to frame it positively, which I think is remarkable. Thank you. So now, Selena, you're working uh, in Latin America. I think you were talking to me about some work you did in El Salvador. A uh, very different situation to the refugee camp, but very similar problems in lots of ways and issues that the young people are dealing with. It is so similar. And as you're speaking, I used to do humanitarian aid. And, and I, you know, you meet children who, whose resilience really, I think, inspires you. And in, in my case, it, I met children in camps like that as well. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about a story that's not dissimilar to Rosa's story that we saw in the video earlier. Um, so we work throughout Latin America, mostly Central America, and the, the homicide rates in Central America are the highest, El Salvador and Honduras, the highest in the world homicide rates. We have the highest femicide rates, which means the killing of girls and women. And, and we have all the other complex issues that many countries face, dropout and violence against girls and women. Um, and I think one thing that resonates is that lack of belonging. One of our, uh, I was recently, and this is why the story came up about a month ago in, one, in a rural area, a coffee producing area, speaking to one of the girls who's in our girls program. Her name's Car Carla, and I was like, you know what, um, tell me a little bit about what this process has been for you. 
And what struck me as a, as a woman also is that she, she kind of looked at me, she paused, and she's, she's soft-spoken, but she's assertive now. And she said, in, in Spanish, she said, yo no creí que era nadie en el mundo. O sea, no, which means I didn't think I was anyone in the world. Like this deep, and her peers next to her were all nodding. And to me, and it was this deep, deep feeling of complete insignificance in the world. Um, and, and she said, you know, and no, when nobody believes you, believes in you, your family tells you you can't do anything. I was pulled out of school when I was 12 because I had to take care of my sister and my father had left, a father who had been abusing the, her and her sister in the house. She had to take over more of the responsibilities and was pulled out of school. So she said, you know, when, when someone you have someone who not sees you, literally sees you that simple, hears you and responds to you. And, and Kofi Annan was talking about the individual. Um, and I think that's really powerful. She said, when someone sees you and believes in you and enables you to have aspirations, she said, now I feel like I can do more things. Um, and, and I acquired the skills to do it. So she's been participating in a program for a year. But for me, she really exemplifies, I think what we all are saying indirectly and um, is the importance on building on strength, on dignity, on human dignity, and really believing in the human potential. And for me, Carla exemplifies a human potential that in spite of the most adverse circumstances, domestic violence, gang violence, having to raise a child at a very young age, um, you can still overcome if you have the opportunities and the support of people around you, whether they're your family or not, but just, you know, this is a bigger community. And Omar, what are the issues you've seen young girls facing in the refugee camps? Just picking up on Selena's point there about and talking about some girls for, for a moment, and how have you helped them deal with those? So I want to I want to start this with a quote that, like, with a quote, a sentence was quoted from from that girl, which is at the first time I met her, I was translating for her between her and the journalist, and she, the journalist, asked her. Why do you love education? And she said, if, they, if we are going back to Syria tomorrow, that's mean I have to study hard tonight because I'm going back to build a country. That was a 12 years old girl. Her name is Muzun. She's famous as the Syrian Malala. I don't know if any, if, if, if any of you like, met, met that girl. She, she came, she literally crossed desert walking, coming to Jordan. And she left, she left in Zatari camp. And she started encouraging her peers to go to register at school and to be educated. And then she, for protection, for, for protection concerns, Muzun was moved to be in another camp, to live in another camp, because she started being famous. Her pictures start to be all around the, the organization's website. And she faced, she faced a lot of challenges from, from the, the, the community she's living in and the the culture that she is living in. She was moved to the other camp. She never, she never stopped. She never, she, she always believed on possibility that it's possible to do what she is dreaming of. And then she, she, she moved to the other camp and she faced the same issues. For, and like that story for three years, but now Muzun, she's studying in UK and she's living in UK and she's the goodwill ambassador for UNICEF for girls and educa education. That story inspired, like, ins it, like inspired every single person worked with Muzun. And that story makes it like, it, it literally shaped my vision saying a leader such like Nelson Mandela, Gandhi, or Martin Luther King will come out from the generation that we are working with. Because they are the one who really know how, uh, who really like, who really know how much peace is important and how much justice is important, and they are the one who can strongly speak of it because they know the dark part, uh, the, the the dark part of it. So what what we do is for for those youth and what we do for uh, for those type of youth, we know that they are in a crossroad. Either they either they build a future and became leaders, either they go 
on uh, on the wrong side and they they start being extremism or violent. So what we do is we stand as a catalyst in their life. We study what are the gaps that they have and what are the gaps that they uh, and like end their life and we fill it positively in order for them to take action and move forward to, to, to more brighter future for themselves. And how do you persuade the girls who don't see education as important um, to take up education? I mean, what are, what are the barriers that are preventing them from doing so? Sorry, how... How, how do you help the girls who, who aren't like Mazoon, who, who don't see the importance of education? And, and what is it that's stopping them seeing that? Because I think you were talking a lot about underage marriage when, when we spoke on the phone. So, the family, so parents, <clears throat> okay, parents and are, are a key factor in this. The, because, when parents came from Syria to Jordan, they were, they were traumatized. And what does that mean? They were not able to take decisions that will help their family in the future. They can't measure the risk of their decisions that, that they are taking. That's why child labor and early marriage became a, a major protection trends that we are facing, that we are facing in the camps. I can tell you at the beginning, we start working with children and we start working with girls in order to raise their awareness, but that was not enough. That was not enough in, uh, in a way that, the, there's a saying that they say in the, in the Syrian culture that the father is the god of the home, the god of the house. So if we are not reaching the father, if we are not protecting the father and the mother and the parents and give them what they need in order to build their confidence and self-esteem, then raise their awareness on child labor, raise their awareness on the importance of education so they can support their, uh, their children toward that. And Assam, are you dealing with similar issues and how are you tackling them? Can we disagree in the panel? You can disagree, <laughs> yes, and I know you do disagree. No, um, just kidding. Um, I, I agree with, with Omar about the, um, the parenting issues, but I think that one of the major problems in this crisis, in the refugee crisis, I'm talking about the Syrian, Iraqi, Middle East, Europe refugee crisis, is that most of the NGOs are a Western NGOs, and they are working with a different mentality. And they are working against the mentality of the people, not through the mentality of the people. And this crisis in Europe, it's, it, it's, it's very unique because it's the first time in the history a huge number of people moved from one area to another, but from a different totally culture to another culture. Most of the, all the, the refugees before, if the World War I, II, or any other crisis, it, the refugees were around their countries. They stay in the very familiar environment, language, culture. This one is a very different. They move to a different um, um, environment, culture, background, language. And even though the, the, the refugees who stay around Syria and Jordan and Iraq, they are not taken care of by, by, by Syrian NGOs or local NGOs. It's, it's pe great people like Omar, but they are with, with, with NGOs who are coming from Europe. And the different attitude and the different mentality, I think it's playing a major role. Um, because I am against teaching parenting, for example, because they used to be parents before a few years. Uh, is the, the feeling of this lady of feeling guilty because of his child, is that she was a bad parent, is, is it the guilt that it's one of the major symptoms of major depression disorder? Or it's the real guilt? The thing is, I agree totally with everything about the parenting and to be a good role model and the education, but the thing is that there is no, we do not address the mental health need in the, with, the, with the adaptation to the cultural background. And I think this, this is the missing link between, between everything that we are doing. The, the pushing uh, a parent to be a good parent sometimes when he has a feeling of guilt because of his depression or PTSD is very dangerous.
it's making him feel more guilty because I'm coming to teach you something, but I know it, but I cannot do it. Please run a marathon, but my leg is broken. I cannot run. No, you can't run because I don't see that his leg is broken. And I think that the, the first thing that we need to do in the issues like this is to respect the, the cultural background and to, and to adopt ourselves to it. But sometimes that might mean challenging the authority, I guess, of the parental figure um, in order to protect the interests of the girls. I think that's what you're saying, Omar, where sometimes they're being exploited and pushed into very early marriage at a very, very young age. Sorry, Selena wants to... I just, I just wanted to say one thing really quickly. I think that what's the, we find that the best strategy is to actually ask the girls um, what they, and I think that also helps in the different cultural context, depending on the age, also figure out how they would. You know, if we're talking about masculinities or family dynamics, say, how would you, once they're informed, how would you talk about this? How would you do this if you were, if I asked you to help us work with families or because th uh, that way there's more agency as well. Yeah. Omar? Okay, so I'm fighting back here and then I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> so maybe <clears throat> as we were discussing outside, maybe the, there is a difference between the early intervention when we go at the, at the time of the crisis and we start uh, serving refugees. For sure, mental health is the is the like the first and the only activity maybe you can uh, you can give to to people but i'm talking also about crisis that it has it has like we are on the sixth year of uh, of the of this crisis and people they've been living in the camp for for six years at the first year they were thinking we were giving them like more more our services and all the services were focusing more on, on their psychosocial well-being their resilience and although also their mental health but because they were thinking that like the refugees they were saying that next week i'll go back to i'll go back to syria and then it became next month i'll go back to syria and then it became next year i'll go back to syria and then they're still there so they start they they like they crossed or they over with, uh, the stage of being like, a, a refugees and, and getting services in order to sustain my present and my basic needs to more be looking for a future. They were like, now they're thinking more about their future. Now there is a refugee in Azraq camp. He is willing to study, uh, to study medicine because they're all, they're, they're all looking, looking forward. And the parenting I, I meant about it is, uh, is not teaching them how, how to be parents, but our program is to change the, let's say the negative practices to more positive one. I always use myself as an example. When I start smoking, my dad, he slapped me in the face. He was like, stop smoking, and he, he slapped me. But like, when he beat me, I took directly a decision that I will never stop smoking. And I am a heavy smoker right now. <laughs> uh, like, yes. <laughs> and so what we are trying to do is those type of practices that the parents that irrationally taking them, we're trying to replace them with more positive practices, with more communication, with more dialogue, and giving, uh, making the child feel more, more val valuable that he is, he is in, a, in a communication. He's talking and he's being heard. LaShawn, the young people you're working with, um, how, how significant is lack of parenting in that instance, and, and what are the general ways that you manage to engage those young people who are like you were when you were younger? How do you get them to follow a different path? Yes, I just want to say that um, I appreciate everything that was just said on this stage. Um, I think in this space, a lot of the, the young people who are disconnected in the U.S., I'll speak for the U.S. particularly, they all, they're, they're, they be, they're looked at as the hardest to reach, hardest to engage, all these different things. But the reality is they fall into all these community-based programs, right? Um, and sometimes programs have the pressure of meeting these outcomes, getting this person placed within nine months, 
or a year or whatever it is, but what you don't realize is that this person just came back from years and years and years and years and years of trauma, being told they can't, um, and everything negative you could possibly think of, right? Um, raising families of their own. So sometimes you have to start, and I'll say with the magic with me, is start with and recognize that this is a whole person, not just um, an outcome. And it starts with love and respect. Um, because when you talk about why young people gravitate to gangs or to go or whichever path that they choose, it's because they didn't get a, something um, from the home, right? And love is something that every human needs, right? And when you don't get it for so long, I used the example yesterday in our meeting. When you're in a desert and you're thirsty, as soon as you see a drip of water, you're, you're running to it, right? You're gravitating to it. You want it. You yearn it. Now, a lot of these young people have been in juvenile hall foster care system, so they've been deprived of love and belonging. So as soon as someone gives them, shows them that some love, whether it's through a gang or whether it's through a mentor, they run towards it, right? And they want it and they, they hold on to it. So that was something that was effective for me and you, Phil, was that I received love from my program manager. He was my mentor. The program manager was my mentor, and I was, um, you know, fortunate to have the rest of the staff support me as well. But to know that I had that one person that was really pushing me and getting me to see beyond my own purview of my own potential, um, that definitely helped. So I would say, um, and then the respect, like you said, when, it, when a child is a dynamic, you're my child, you know, I own you and I can do whatever I want to get you to stop. And you see, he resented the fact that his father slapped him and he continues to, to smoke, right? So it's like, and in school, for me, I, a, lot, a lot of the issues that I had was going back and forth with teachers. Like I knew they wouldn't give me what I needed. And if I dared to tell them that, oh, you're disrespecting me, go to the office, right? So there was no respect there. Um, so those are the two things. Now, when you talk about the, the journey of transformation, there's a few critical things. There's five Ps. I'll try to stick to three. If I have time, I'll go to five. Now, the first one is helping a young person find their passion, right? So like I said, a lot of times we, we, we young people, opportunity youth, um, we really can't see, we're in survival mode. We can't see beyond the day, sometimes beyond the hour, right? So to get us to think beyond and vision into the future of what we want to be is nearly impossible, right? Um, and therefore, if they're misguided, they don't care about anything, they don't care about themselves, it's easy for them to kill someone or tear down the community or do whatever it is that's detrimental to themselves and others. But when they can find a passion and a purpose, now they have something to work towards, right? And helping them find that's not going to be an easy job because it's easy to tell them, come do construction or come do this. But if their heart and their soul is not in it, they'll, they'll do it. But will they, will they um, be successful and persist through it? Probably not because they don't have that connection. So in you, Phil, they exposed me to a lot. I wanted to be an HVAC, an electrician every week, but finally I landed on um, higher ed and criminal justice specifically because I understood that there was a systemic um, issue that was preventing me and several of my peers from being able to pro progress in life. So I said, I have to study this system so that I can flip it. So that passion got me through four or five years of school studying law and justice, right? Um, if that's not there, they're probably not going to be successful. So I'll say the first one is tapping into that passion. I would say the second one is um, preparation. Um, because I think a lot of what gravitates young people to our programs is that they've been written off by the traditional system. They love coming into these environments where they get the one-on-one -on -one attention, they get the love, they get the respect, they get everything they need, right? But the reality is we can pour that into them, but we also have to make sure that they're prepared to integrate back into that traditional system that they felt like wouldn't receive them. So, again, making sure that we're leveling them up, building up their skills, building up their resiliency so that they can get what they need, but also be prepared to, to transition back into life. And I'll tie that back to like reentry services and talking about the importance of planning with folks who are reintegrating into society. If you're locked up for five years and you lost contact with your family, you have no social connection, and they come to you a week before you're getting out and say, okay, where are you going to live? Where are you, you know, how, where are you going to work? You know, where, you know, all these different things. That's overwhelming for someone when they got a week to figure out all these different things. But if you put in a plan three months ahead and they put in support systems, they've applied for services, all these different things, that integration is even more easier. So again, the preparation is, is key. Um, I think another, another P is the promise because when you get a young person to really vision a new life for themselves and really get them to see their potential, you have to, I used this term yesterday too, you know, their head's gonna big up, their vision is going places, right? They've never visioned before, some of them. 
But now you have to pop that bubble and get them to realize it. Now, if you want to get there, here's what you have to do to get to that. You have to work long nights. You have to go to school. You have to study. You have to do all these different things that they're not used to. Some of these young people don't have that type of discipline. So, and if you lay that out for them, it's going to overwhelm the freak out of them. They're going to be like, oh, no, I'm not, I'm, you know, that was good, but I'm checking out. But if they have an adult or a pair or a program there to promise them, we're here to support you. Yeah, this road's not going to be easy. I'm not going to lie to you. It's not going to be easy. You know what I mean? But we're here to give you tools, support, guidance, love, whatever you need to get through it. And then the, the likelihood of them going through um, is that much, the chances are that much greater um, when they feel like they're support and they feel like they're not alone. Um, and... Yeah, I think, I think another important one is patience because, again, you, we have young people who are transforming. Sometimes we paint this image that once you've gone on to college or once you get a career, you've made it, you're, you're, you've got the picket fence and all those different things. And the reality is sometimes life gets even harder. So to, to paint that false image for them that, that as soon as they get on this path, their life's going to be sweet and they're just going to breeze through, it's like, no. You got student loans. You got to have to work. You know, I, my father got killed in the middle of me going to transition from community college to a four-year university. Now, that was one of the most ch challenging times of my life. I could have easily gave up, you know, or backtracked, but I knew my father put for education. I knew that I had to... He left behind three little girls, right, in addition to, you know, me. I was the only boy. So I had to fill in his shoes. I had to provide. I had to make sure that I could be an example for my sister. So, again, I pushed forward, and I, had, I could see the light at the end of the tunnel. But these are some of the things that these young people have to deal with when they're trying to get their lives on track, you know, not having that support at home. Because another thing I'll, I'll stop here is that they spend six, maybe five, six, seven, eight hours in a program. What do you think they spend the rest of their hours in the streets, in the home? So everything you taught them in that eight hours can either go down the drain or, you know, they can be reinforced and receive that support in other places. Um, so I just want to um, stop there. <laughs> I, very wise words, I think, and uh, an amazing program. I mean, LaShawn, you sound like you were very self-propelled and you drove yourself through. But, Selena, I'm sure you come across young people who don't have that push. And how do you motivate them and how do you give them that vision of what's possible because I think the common theme coming out here is that a lot of these kids have no level of aspiration nobody's believed in them nobody's loved them how do you turn that around well and I loved everything you said I mean it's it's true but I, I think there's so many contextual factors that are so difficult like if you're in school if you go to school you're in public school for four hours a day really bad quality public education. Four hours, you have eight hours basically free, so you're either working, selling something on the street, or you're getting into trouble, and you probably have one or two members of your family that's either in a gang or in jail. And on top of that, you've either witnessed or experienced violence firsthand, which has all sorts of implications, mental health implications. So um, I think there's so much to say for making sure that there's consistency in all these things. And, and, you know, for us, when we do the programming in public schools, the after-school programming, it's a commitment. And, of course, we looked at models around the world to see what works. But the commitment of two hours a week all year is for a reason, because it's not, you can't just go through transformation. Youth Build is an amazing program, and it's five months. But for the most part, you're battling against a context that's pushing down, 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 making you feel like you can't get through, and you're seeing people die constantly, right? Like, constantly, people near you that had good intentions that you believe are good people. And I also think sometimes with um, the draw for kids in gangs or in, in terrorist groups, that draw, that empty space or that need, we also have to be really careful um, when we work in this space, at least for us, we don't criminalize the gangs. Like, we don't um, c kind of reinforce that stigma. In fact, we don't even talk about gangs. We talk about youth, and we talk to them about their potential. And when they bring up the gang, you acknowledge that it is part of an identity, because at the end of the day, if your identity's been built on that, and one of your parents or your siblings, or, even, or you've been in jail or served time, 
it's an acknowledgement of an identity in order to work with young people to see what else is part of their identity outside of that. Um, so it's really building on assets and not so, so much like let's build up these weak young people or vulnerable, it's more like, you know, what do we build on? What assets do you have? What resilience, like how do we build your resilience? And then as a community, um, we can't always expect the parents because they're working a million jobs, because they have trauma, because they're being beaten at home. So how do we create a bigger community, whether that's the public school, um, other actors in the community, and how do we really get engaged on an individual level to build that individual and that community um, resilience and strength to be able to prevent uh, death, really, to keep these kids alive and believing in themselves, and then hopefully being like you, <laughs> and you know, leading their peers into in in and under so they understand that there are options, um, concrete options, and and can develop a plan, an individual plan to do that. I want to can I say something quickly to what she just said, just really building on the 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 assets and the contributions that they already have, especially with gangs, because you know we did a lot with gangs. Um, a lot of coming from low-income um, urban communities. Um, but even though they use, like a hammer can be used for good or for bad. It could be used to build a house or it could be used to bash somebody upside the head, right? Now, gangs, they're used for bad, but these young people learn a lot of skills. And they gangs are organizations, right? They have a finance person. They got people doing operations, you know? And these young people are entrepreneurs, right? So you can get to them to realize that, okay, you guys have skills, then... <laughs> Here's how you can transfer this. A lot of it's code switching. Again, just not them coming to it like you don't have any skills. Like you guys are entrepreneurs. We used to, um, you know what I mean? And it's, sometimes it's hard to get someone who's used to being their own boss and making a lot of money and then tell them, okay, you need to stop that and go work for McDonald's and get paid $7 an hour and work for the next person. You know what I mean? That's what we're competing against, right? But if you can get them to, again, see that. So that's, what, that's why we're trying to talk to our young people more about entrepreneurship in the right way, <laughs> you know what I mean, so that we can acknowledge the skills that they already have and contributions that they already have and apply it to a different context because they do already have a lot of skills to contribute. And do you have, either of you, do you have particular methods that you use? Um, LaShawn talked about the five Ps. Um, Assam, I think you talked about four, a four-step method. Yeah, the, the four-step approach is... Um, 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 a methods that we use that I drafted is about talking, it's talking about one mind for a stage of mind. We think that uh, not just the body go through a journey when, 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 the, when we become a refugee, but also our mind. And we need to adjust and our intervention, our psychosocial intervention and mental health intervention to each stage of mind that the refugee goes through. And and sometimes if we don't, maybe we, we, we do harm. Uh, the first stage that we talk about is the acute trauma, is the mistrust in the sea when there is bombing. There you cannot do treatment, for example. You cannot just go and sit until the, someone tell me what happens to you. It's debriefing. It's dangerous, for example. It's do some, do some, you know, fix the trauma experience. So we need to acknowledge which stage the, the refugee is and to, to give the suitable intervention. The second stage you are talking when they are in a transit camp, but Omar talked that now in Jordan, for example, they went out of this, uh, uh, this situation. Now they are feeling that this is home. And in the transit situation, for example, as in the camps in Greece, the people are not ready for nothing. Like, you want to come and talk with them, help them. They, they, are, they are like on the edge all the time. I want to go. And you tell them that you are not going home. You are not going to Germany. In the case of Greece, it's Germany. Um, but they, they are not. And the third stage of mind is when they are leaving and relocated or they becoming or believe that this is... You know, there is nothing to do, and this is, will become home, or they are going back home, and they are moving again. And the fourth stage of mind is when they are resettled, or they go back home, and then we see more disorders coming uh, um, out, uh, not just symptoms and signs, but we see PTSD and depression and the hardcore psychiatry, and the treatment should be different there. So uh, as professionals, uh, we try to, first of all, to, to see which 
which stage of mind the refugees are now and to give the, the, um, the suitable intervention. For example, in the first stage of mind is what we are doing with the kids like Omar, which try to change the, the narrative for them. Um, I have a, a, a nice story about <clears throat> how we can change the, um, you know, change the whole experience, not just the experience, but the motiv to give them some motivation. Um, uh, before two months, less than two months, I have been in um, a rescue mission, one of our rescue mission with uh, the Spanish lifeguards Pro Activa Open Arms um, in the Seychelles rescue zone next to Libya in the Mediterranean Sea. And we rescued a boat around 70 miles from, uh, from Libya. They were in the sea for like around 16 hours. We thought when we arrived to the boat that they will be dead because we have, we looked for them like 10 hours and we were sure that the captain said there is no, no boat like this can survive the weather, but actually all of them were fine. And we finished the rescue and I do the psychological first aid and the mental health intervention and we help them with everything, blankets and etc. But there were a, a young guy around 16, 17 years old and that he was anxious. He all the time just walked around the, the boat. He was not calm. And I tried to talk with him. I explained to him that everything is okay. The Coast Guard will come. He will be in Italy in a few hours. He couldn't calm down. The rest were fine. That we put music, they started dancing, but Abed couldn't calm down. And when I start talking with him, um, and I say, okay, I have nothing to do. The Italian Coast Guard is coming and I need to do some kind, I need to do an intervention. I cannot give him a, uh, um, Abid like this and I ask him what's happening because in the first stage we don't open the wounds like but I couldn't do nothing and I had to ask him and he, he told me that he's for one year he was in a slavery camp in Libya he's from Darfur he tried to cross the border and the, the militias in Libya caught him and he was in a slavery camp for one year and because he tried to run away a few times and his family was looking for him, they ask from him, they make him dig his grave and take picture of the grave and send it to the family. So for his family, he was dead. And he started telling me the stories and he was crying and I, nothing. I did all, everything I know from the books. I didn't know from the books. I tried, but he's, he's not coming down. I go to the head of the mission. I told him, look, we cannot give him the, the Coast Guard. He's like, in two hours, he will be psychotic. He will commit suicide, even though not in two months, he will be like going around the streets of Sicily. He said, come on, we, there's nothing to do with the Coast Guard. They are army. Um, then comes to my mind, ask him, do you have any papers or something? So he do like this, and he give me just a small paper like this, and it was written in Arabic, mama, yes, mother, and the phone number. This is the only thing that he kept the whole year and a half around slavery camps. So I went to the captain, to Marco, I said, Marco, we need to use the satellite phone. And we called him mother. And it was a crazy, crazy, crazy conversation. It was funny because after five minutes, the, some, the, one of the crew came to me and told me, if you are dead and then you call your mother, what kind of conversation will be? I said, oh, yeah, yeah. So I took the phone because I saw that there was something wrong. He's not happy and he's like fighting with his mom. So I took the phone and explained to the mother why his the children, child is calling her. Um, and after that, all the symptoms disappeared and he was calmed down, he saw laughing and he, and he just go down and dance and etc. And I follow him through our online clinic. And like three months, eh, three weeks later, I ask him, where are you? He said, um, we need to finish early because I'm going to the Italian language lesson. I said, oh, perfect, good. Where's the rest of the fellows? Because I know his rest of the people who stay with him. He say, no, they are home, they don't wanna go. I say, why? I say, don't want, I encourage them, they don't want. And I found out that this guy, that he was the vulnerable cases in the boat, he was the hard case, in the, the whole people in the boat, he was the one who has the motivation to go every day to the language school. He want to be a doctor now, you know, something in psychology, like so identification, you know, become like his, like his, equal to his therapist, and etc. And the others, and unfortunately, and like we don't have this kind of service, we cannot provide it to everyone because of lack of support, lack of support. But um, the others, even though they didn't have the same hard experience, they are not 
um, um, willing to do stuff now because they lose the motivation. But we can see that with a very short kind of intervention, we can give a lot of hope to someone and to change the whole narrative and the whole experience and also his future. It may be cost us one million now to do stuff like this, but trust me, it will save a lot of billions later. And even you, though that you are against refugees and you are right-wing parties or politician or foundation, whatever, it's better to put money in these things of issue because then the refugees will be strong enough to go back and rebuild their countries. If not, they will be just in the street of Europe and everywhere doing nothing and easily recruited for, for, for bad and criminal things. Another um, incredible story and, and showing how intervention really can help to turn lives around. Um, we've got about five minutes left and if anybody would like to ask questions, uh, we can get a microphone to you. So do put up your hand. Just looking around the room, I've got the lights in my eyes. W while you think about it, if you have got a question, I know LaShawn has a good um, example as well of a young man that you rather struggled to get him, I think, to, to turn his life around, but got there in the end. Oh, yeah. Um, this is just an example of um, one of the P's I mentioned, which was patience. <laughs> um, a good friend of mine named Govinda, uh, we both worked in a factory um, at Frito-Lay, um, we were miserable to say the least. Um, anyone who's worked in a factory you could tell you. Um, some of you probably had good experiences, but I didn't. Um, but you know, he, like many other young people from, um, uh, from the community that I come from, they don't really, we don't see too many people that went on to college or see higher ed as sort of like a path for us. So, you know, because I had this experience, I felt obligated to, to pay it forward, right? And that's the fifth P that I failed to mention was pay it back and pay it forward. Um, so I'm talking to this young man because he's talking to me about how miserable he is in this warehouse, just like me. And I'm like, so, okay, so what are you doing about it? You know, here's a way you can, here's a ticket out. You know, you can go to community college, give it a try. And he was just, nah, screw that. That's for lames. All these different things. And I'm looking at him like, you know, I go to college, right? So I'm just taking all these insults from him. Um, but I'm just letting him, you know, just give it a try. But he had internalized that it wasn't for him. He literally told me, it's not for me. I'm a hands-on guy. I can't do this. But, 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 but. So um, I guess he was watching me because he'll see me like studying on my breaks. I'll have to request time off to go to conferences. And he started to see the benefits of education, right? So he was watching me silently. Then one day we were, we were walking and he was like, hey, can you help me get into college? <laughs> so I'm like, oh, now you want to come on board, right? But that's all I have to say, that you can talk to young people till you go blue in the face, but you have to show them. Because, again, you can't take for granted that they don't have these role models in the home. Our parents have been telling us to go to college since we were younger. None of them showed us how to fill out FAFSA. They don't even know when we have to do FAFSA, we have to teach them how to do it, right? So it's one thing to tell a young person. It's another thing to show him. Um, but being the patient person that I am, I welcomed him with open arms, let him know, okay, I got you. Because everybody's light goes off at a different point because everyone has different challenges in their lives and things that prevent them from being able to focus. Uh, but when his light went off, I was there to, to support him. And now, you know, grown men still tagging me on Facebook. I got an A, thanks to LaShawn encouraging me to go. You know, it feels good. Um, but yeah, definitely pay it back. Because again, I can't reemphasize it's 4.9 million in the US, 1.2 billion across the world. And one, person, one young person at a time, um, we have to provide that opportunity. Uh, there's a lady here who has a question. I don't know if we've got a microphone for you. you can come and grab mine. Here it comes. Mr. Assam, you mentioned the reinstitution of these um, refugees into their new environments. What steps do they have to take? And how hard is it for them mentally to do, to be instituted into their new environments? Thank you. Sorry, we didn't quite get your question. How hard is it to, for them to assimilate into new environments? Yeah. yeah. How hard is it for them to assimilate into new environments having come from one place? Um, it's actually, they don't succeed to do it until now uh, because it's not just we need to think we we, for, we 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 forget also the host communities they are not ready and it's also hard for the host communities to host them it's two two different cultures 
So it's hard for the refugees themselves to integrate in a different Western community on host, and also it's hard for the community to accept them. So one of the things that we are trying to do is a lot of intercultural activities and, and lectures and to tell them what's the meaning of, of Christmas and what's the meaning of Ramadan. Um, and um, if we do not address these subjects, they will be isolated all the time. Until now, there is, uh, I think most of them are really isolated in the, in the big cities of Europe. And isolation is, is, is very bad to the integration process. Yes. I have a quick, well, question, suggestion um, for Omar, because as you were describing that situation, the refugees and, and saying how they were in a new, a new context, how it was different than other groups because they were in a new context where they didn't know the language and things. It made me think even farther back to slavery, even though we were refugees, you know, we were forced to come somewhere where, like, and it's, it's something that I care really about because my family who comes from um, the Cabo Verde the Islands, they were stripped of their culture because they were forced to assimilate into this American lifestyle, right? So I, my question to you is like, um, how is history um, or other groups who have been um, sort of treated the same way um, helping you guys come up with a strategy to, to work with this group? It's, it's not far away. Um, I'm a refugee myself. Like I'm, I'm, my nation has his own agency. You know, there is UNHCR for everyone and there is UNRWA for us, the Palestinians. So I think that what we are doing is translating 70 years of, of narrative, of experience, of war, and say, that's it, we are not the, the center of the world and we need just accept something and, and we want to do something for others. And I think that our group just stepped down from being passive and to an active position where we translate our suffering to knowledge. Uh, and I think that's what gives us a, a unique position in this crisis, I think. Um, thank you so much to everyone on the panel. Some amazing stories and amazing examples of what it's like not to be a bystander and to do really positive things to help disaffected young people in a range of circumstances. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please keep your seats. Lunch will be served at your tables.